Okay. Aran, would you like to pray? Yeah, sure, Master. Yeah, sure. please go ahead. Let, let me pray. Lord, we give all glory and honor to you for um, blessing this and another new day, another new week, Lord. Lord, help us all to see the um, incredible hidden word from your word, from your wonderful word, Lord, as we dive in in your word, Lord. And Lord, help each and every one of us to um, to to understand and experience your love. And our Lord, transform us so that, Lord, Father, we will enable to share your wonderful word to others and comfort them, Lord. So, Lord, uh, bless everyone. And I submit the rest of the day, rest of the session into your loving hand. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Arun. We were, we were looking at Hebrews chapter 12. So let's continue from there. And uh, today we should be able to complete Hebrews. And I'm hoping we can start First Peter. So we saw how we had Hebrews 11, where there was the lives of several men and women of faith recorded for us. And that is our encouragement the um, writer of the hebrews encourages the struggling jews and tells them that they can take courage from those who have finished their race by faith and uh, he and he encourages endurance among the believers and we saw how endurance refers to uh, employing patience in our trials or difficult situations and um, making sure that we don't give up but we reach to the end of the race and then he adds there that not only should we look to good um, life stories of men and women which is wonderful but our greatest example is that of the lord jesus christ so in verse 2 he says looking unto jesus jesus is our focus so that we must not change you know when we look at the lives of men and women i'm sure there will be uh, aspects of their life where maybe they had failed early on in their walk with the Lord. So there are weaknesses that we observe. But when we look at the life of Jesus, we see that he always overcame. So the life of Jesus is a perfect life, and which is why looking at the life of Jesus is the best thing that we can do. Uh, and he says we can draw our strength from there. He is our uh, uh, he's the author and the finisher of our faith. So in other words, you know, he is the source of our faith. And he says that uh, uh, Jesus endured a lot on the cross because he was looking ahead. He had an eternal perspective. He was not just focused on the events that were unfolding uh, before him, but he knew that God had a purpose and that God is going to redeem mankind through his sufferings. So that is the reason Jesus went through it. So he had an eternal perspective and we are also encouraged to have an eternal perspective when it comes to going through, through trials and sufferings. Now we uh, saw that Jesus despised the shame because there was a lot of um, shame associated with the cross. We know that he was put down verbally. He was beaten physically. A, thrown, a, throw, a crown of thorns was put on his head. Uh, he was uh, called names. So many things happened to Jesus. So the whole experience of being on the cross was shameful to say the least. But no, he was not uh, occupied or consumed by the natural occurrences. Uh, instead, he chose to focus on what God was doing. And similarly, when we go through some of the trials and tribulations, there can be shame associated with it, you know, persecution, opposition from people when we want to do what God has called us to do. Or in, uh, you can also call it as run the race. When we are running our race, the way Jesus ran his race. Um, but we must be like Christ who completed the race anyway and he sat down at the uh, right hand of God. Thus far, thus far, we have taken courage from these words. Uh, we've seen how Jesus endured hostility and, uh, uh, you know, 
he overcame and uh, keeping him as our focus is always something that will strengthen us so now coming to the next section here in hebrews chapter 12 i'm at verse 5 there is uh, um you know there is how this uh, instruction where the believer is told that god is also someone who chastises us okay um so to understand chastisement what we say is it is correction um, that is brought about as nurturing okay so as part of nurturing when correction is um spoken over someone that is known as chastisement so chastisement can be understood well when we look at how parents correct their children parents always want their children to do well they want their children to uh, excel in life so uh, as children grow up if they are being disobedient or if they are being careless there are times that you know parents will you know, spank them or you know give them a nice rebuke or uh, you know uh, different ways in which they they correct and um, bring chastisement but in a parent's chastisement of a child um, the the aspect of love is always there because a parent does not want to destroy the child and his or her future what they're doing is building them up by teaching them what is right so that is chastisement and in the same way here um, the writer encourages the believers you know sometimes not all trials that we go through are chastisement but sometimes there can be certain trials uh, we are in which is like god correcting us as a parent so when that happens we as his children should not despise or um, you know uh, like just neglect the work that god is doing in our lives and uh, we should not be discouraged when god rebukes us because we are told that the for whom the lord loves he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives so god does this act of correction because he loves us okay and uh, because he considers us sons and daughters now if we were not sons and daughters then you know there is really no need for god to be so involved in our lives now moving forward verse 7 we notice that if you endure chastening so we've understood god corrects us, us at times and some trials are because god's correction is um, unfolding in our lives now when that is happening we're not supposed to despise it and we are supposed to endure it and we've already seen that endurance is bearing up under pressure so when there's a lot of pressure around us we must maintain our courage we must maintain the focus the way jesus endured the cross okay he looked at the joy set before him he looked at the eternal perspective so in the same way we go through our trial uh, even one of chastening and look ahead at the things that god has kept for us okay now whenever we endure uh, chastening or correction from god we must think that god is dealing with me as a son or a daughter okay now imagine if a parent does not correct their child that's not proper parenting there's always instances in parenting where parents have to teach the child you know right from wrong and it may involve doing it in a strict sort of a way uh, and only then you know a parent is fulfilling their responsibility now if the parent does not do that they are not um, you know helping the child understand uh, you know the, everything they they require to lead a, a 
uh, you know a righteous adult life so it's preparation chastening is actually preparation now if god does not correct us you know again we will not be fully developed in our character so we are told here in hebrews for what son is there whom a father does not chasten so every good father will correct and shape their children okay so in the same way because god considers us sons and daughters he does the chastening uh, but you no know, as i told you what if the parents don't chase their children you know um, a very strong statement is made here that but if you are without chastening of which all have become partakers they are then you are illegitimate and not sons so uh, and you know it generally doesn't happen in the parenting scenario because parents love their children and they make sure that they bring some sort of a correction in their journey in the ch- in the child's journey so now uh, if a parent is not interested that's unfortunate okay and uh, uh, let's say in the case of uh, um uh, you know a child uh, is who does not you know really have uh, their uh, uh, own father or mother you know that kind of love is lacking in in some cases and so uh, it's as if you know, they are not fulfilling their responsibility as a parent and that you know if if that parental love is there that bond of father and son is uh, you know it it exists and that's why they are correcting you but in the case of you know what's mentioned here illegitimate sons now uh, it's a strong way of saying that only when that real parental love is lacking one is okay to let the child grow however they like then they're not bothered whether the child is going to suffer in the future and you know go through all kinds of difficulties but god is not like that because he cares for us because he wants to um see us developed in our character there are times that we may go through correction from god now again you know i'm just pointing out that it's like a parental love and nurturing no parent will uh, harm a child to the extent where you know their spirit is broken or um, you know they are badly uh, hurt now Uh, we do know that in some instances where you know the parent is mentally ill or you know doesn't recognize or realize um that they are doing that to their child they end up hurting children but that's not the right way okay? in general a parent will always be um, have the safety of the child in their minds so they will Uh, beat yes but you know they it's it's like they want to protect they don't want it to uh, uh, leave a deep scar in the child's heart their only intention is correct yourself that's all it's it's not any deeper than that the hurt that a rebuke of a parent should inflict on a child so in that way you know god also corrects us so we must see you know people look at the uh, challenges that they go through and they might say okay you know this is god's chastening but you know god doesn't put sickness on us that's not chastening we are quite clear because in the nature of god we've seen that he's a healer so if he's a healer he cannot put sickness on us so in the name of god chastening us we shouldn't include things that god has already clearly defined as the works of the devil because 1 john 3:8 says that jesus came to destroy the works of the devil so there are also the works of the devil that can inflict pain and suffering on us we shouldn't confuse the two that's my point god's chastening is a nurturing chastening where no yes there is a rebuke yes there is a correction but it is meant to build us and never meant to break us okay and uh, our response to the chastening is equally important verse 9 we see we have had human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect because as children maybe while growing up we didn't understand we thought oh why is this happening but when we grew up 
we recognized oh if my father would not have taught me that or if my mother would not have taught me that no i wouldn't know how to live my life so in the same way when we look at god correcting us no we must have greater reverence that oh god is so interested in my life that i'm going through a training or an equipping into uh, righteousness okay so it really the chastening of god is a good thing because we are receiving god's love through the chastening so if we paid respect to our parents who corrected us when we were children you know we are told that we should not neglect god or we should not um uh, reject what god is doing in our lives we must embrace okay god if you are uh, allowing this chastening in my life i'm sure there is something you want me to learn from it i will learn you know to have a good attitude and a positive attitude while going through that trial um again you know there's a lot of comparison of parents you no know, father they chastened us for a few days as it seemed best to them uh, but god is doing this for our profit you know it's not like god wants something out of this but you know, he knows we are going to benefit out of it and you see the results of chastening you know when we go through correction from god what is it going to produce in us we i pointed out when parents correct us discipline okay um we we learn right from wrong so those are all the outcomes of chastening when god corrects us you know the result is holiness that we may be partakers of his holiness you see god is not only interested in we earlier said run the race finish the race you know don't give up endure look unto jesus he is not just interested in what we can do but he is so interested in who we become he wants us to become like him and we know that god is a holy god and he wants us to be holy and through the work that god is doing in our lives you know in various ways what happens when you engage in the word sincerely you have faith in the word apply the word live the word speak the word you are becoming you and i are becoming holier and holier right yes god has already done the work of uh, redemption on the cross we are the righteousness of god in christ jesus but we have to live it out okay so in the living out we are becoming more like jesus so even the chastening of god will yield the fruit of holiness in our lives now chastening we are told uh, is not joyful okay anyone who enjoyed uh, uh, a spanking that you got from your dad or mom i don't think so so in the same way he's saying when we go through trials um that is really chastening from god it's never joyful in the present it is never joyful but how is it it is painful however again he points to the outcome and he says it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it so what should be the outcome of responding fa uh, favorably to the correction of the lord holiness peaceable fruit of righteousness so um uh, it's it's what god is working towards we know that uh, the uh, fivefold ministry offices you know, they have been appointed by god to equip the body of christ for what you know, to be mature to come to the fullness Okay. uh in christ jesus to become the perfect man so everything is tending towards perfection in the work that god does and what is this perfection the perfection that we are looking for is the very character of jesus christ so the believers are encouraged and they are told come on you know some trials are the uh, the works of the devil he is bringing it against us but there can be some trials which are the chastening of the lord but when it is a trial that is a chastening of the lord remember that it's a very loving correction okay god is not going to break our bones and you know put us down and totally crush us that's not how god works but 
So there is uh, an element of going through pain. What is that pain? The pain is the the rebellion of our flesh. We don't want to change. We don't want to, um, uh, you know, uh, change our standards to the standards of God's word. So our flesh is crying out. That's the pain that we are talking about. But when we yield to it, the outcome is becoming more like Jesus, maturing, holiness, righteousness. Okay, So that is the result. So we must yield to it. And that's what he is saying that he again encourages them. And he says, strengthen the hands which hang down and feeble knees. You know, these believers, not just them, you know, even us in our journey with the, uh, the Lord, our faith journey, sometimes we can become very weary, you know, tired. So it's nice to listen to a word like this where uh, there is, come on, you know, strengthen yourself, encourage yourself. It's a word like that to just pat them on the back and say, come on, you can do it. So here the, uh, the writer is just giving them that, that element of encouragement. And he says, for you to finish the race, you have to make sure that you know your members uh, or your body is strong. So strengthen your hands, your feeble knees. You know, make it uh, stronger. Make straight paths for your feet. So you make sure that you will be able to complete the race. It's like talking to a real, uh, you know, a runner who who will ensure that they are maintaining all fitness and they have cleared out know everything in their path so that they can complete the race so believer you make sure that you are strong and you are able to complete god's assignment for your life okay uh, but what if you don't do that he's saying that this these weak hands and feeble knees what will it lead to lameness you know what you it it will make the person lame and also you know, if you're not careful enough in this case, he says, let it not be dislocated or uh, just making us more dysfunctional from running in the race. So we shouldn't allow that to happen to us, but rather be healed. So even if you have gone through uh, a bout of discouragement, you know, you rise up, you uh, we read in the Bible, you know, David encouraged himself in the Lord. And sometimes we sit and wait around, yeah, let the pastor come, let them encourage me, or, you know, let my family member encourage me, or uh, church elder, let them encourage me. No, but don't wait. If you and I are in the race to maintain those high spirits and excitement of running the race, it's our responsibility. So I have to do whatever it takes to become strong in God and uh, keep looking. There are people who have gone through difficulties, but they finish the race. Jesus finished the race. I can finish the race. So strengthen myself. How? Spiritually, emotionally, physically. I do what it takes to complete the journey. So that is the attitude believers need to maintain. Then he continues, you know, now uh, a little bit about the community living, uh, how should the believers be? So you will see that from Hebrews 12, his his thought process is changing from topic to topic. OK, uh, so don't get confused. Just follow along. So now he says, uh, pursue peace with all people. So how should we live in community with people? So peace is a very, very critical um, mm, uh, element. There are believers who will maintain, you know, who have, you know, we have tiffs with people, we, we don't get along, we break relationships. So that happens uh, in even among believers. But as far as possible, the Bible says, yes, I, I'm sure that, you know, every individual, in each one of us here, we don't perfectly gel with you know, 100% of the people in our lives. But that doesn't mean that we should uh, clash with them or, you know, we should break relationships with them. That's not what it is. But in a peaceable way, now you know how you can live in a peaceable way with everyone. You do your best. You do your best. Now, if they are the ones who don't no longer want to, uh, you know, uh, be in, in uh, that brotherly relationship with us, then we can't help it. But, no, we can do our part, live 
peacefully with people maintain that shalom don't create trouble to risk relationships that's the that's the point here and as god's people it says peace pursue peace with all people so do your part okay to be at peace with all people so that's about our horizontal relationship and it says and holiness holiness is vertical relationship holiness without holiness you know uh, we can't we can't see god without purity of heart we can't see god and we know that god is worshiped in the beauty of his holiness so the primary attraction of god is he's a holy god that is what draws us to him and if we don't imbibe the same character of holiness it's when we offer worship to god you know it's not it's not the kind of worship that god wants he wants holiness in our lives he wants holiness in our worship he wants us to acknowledge his holiness and follow after his holiness and that's the call for us so in our vertical relationship with god maintain holiness is what we are told and again he says without which without holiness no one will see the lord okay so because a sin it, you know it it uh, um clouds our vision of god when there is sin we are not able to uh, fully grasp who god is so it's so important holiness is very very important then he says uh, that we just have to be careful about our spiritual life um, looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of god so don't ever fall short of god's grace so what should we do in order to have god's grace we already know that god gives grace to the humble so walk in humility and when god gives us grace you know he through the grace he gives us gifts so we have to also use the grace that god has given us and that is the way in which we honor the grace of god over our lives put it to use uh, and uh, you know let it be a blessing to the kingdom let it be a blessing to you know god himself god will be so proud oh wow you know i bless them with this you remember the uh, parable of uh, the good steward uh, you have one one uh, um uh, what talent given to that that person he didn't put it to use so the master was so upset he really wants us to use whatever he has given us so let's put it to use for the glory of his name so uh, don't ever you know fall short of god's grace and we can talk about grace in many angles and say that in this way you know his empowering grace is the redeeming grace whatever in all this don't ever fall short lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble now in the community life you know, he is um now uh, mentioning a very key thing and that is bitterness you know sometimes what happens mm, we have community of believers and uh, there are people get offended anyone who does not want to get offended you know i i'll tell you the best way is don't have don't relate with people that's the only way to be safe but when we relate with people and especially when it comes to the kingdom of god it's not to live alone we cannot live alone we are meant to work with others worship together with others so there is community there are people that god has put in our lives you can't escape it i can't escape it okay so to not be offended or experience some something uh, you know that puts you off with other believers if you don't want those things to happen you should be a lone ranger you have to be alone lock yourself up in the room but that's not happening okay here in the world we have to step out but when we do interact with people we are in in a heart of uh, forgiveness so that is the best way to do community life now uh, if we don't have that attitude of forgiveness even you know when we bring correction as leaders or when we speak the truth in love that's what we are told okay we are not called to you know um, harm others put others down break their spirit even god doesn't do it when he is chastening his children he does it like a father and so same thing applies you know, to the leaders in the church 
a heart of forgiveness is what is required from the believers of the church now if they are not walking in forgiveness you know they end up having they can develop you know, there is a progression isn't it the unforgiveness turns into resentment it can then become bitterness jealousy all the other uh, uh like you know stronger stronger uh, attitudes of the heart stronger negative attitudes of the heart so he is warning the community of believers you know don't ever let bitterness spring up because what will it lead to it will lead to trouble cause trouble so he says root of bitterness so that's also interesting because as leaders when we observe that bitterness has started that is it has taken root still you didn't get a big tree you have to quickly chop it off you have to uproot it immediately otherwise what happen it will become a big tree it will cause chaos in the church division in the church you know we have, there are so many uh, instances where churches were destroyed because of fights and strife and you know things that believers are um, uh, in the way in which believers are behaving and uh, that is very sad and we should never let that happen let's begin let us begin with us first and as leaders we must ensure that it doesn't take root in the community it's very um, uh, dangerous to have bitterness uh, and then he says by this many became defiled or uh, it corrupts the entire community so be careful uh, and then he says let's lest there be any fornicator or profane person like esau uh, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright so again you know, he points out to uh, uh, an attitude where you know you don't take the uh, you don't take the call of god seriously that's the example of esau what did he do you know god he was rightfully the uh, elder uh, child but when he was hungry he sold his birthright how careless you know, god gave a beautiful uh, position to him but he sold it in a moment of weakness so which means that he did not value what god gave him and when god especially in the kingdom there are spiritual blessings that god gives us callings that god gives us gifts inheritance that he gives us when we don't value it that displeases god and that is why there is a strong word used for uh, esau's attitude we in what is given in the bible we don't see him as a fornicator you know fornicators uh, are people who um, indulge in uh, you know like immoral sexual relationship um, outside of actually without marriage there's no um, they people are not married and still they are engaging in uh, sexual uh, uh, activity that is fornication and it is displeasing to god so about esau you know, the term used is fornicator but what did he actually do uh, he rejected spiritual inheritance and that was as good as fornication in god's sight so you know something for us to learn that god uh, really wants us to embrace our spiritual blessings and inheritance okay <laughs> because he rejected it uh, and he did not repent with the right heart even though later on you know he came back uh, and sought it with tears it was never given back to him so it's a warning for believers you know, don't don't play around with what god has given us if you, if we just uh treat it very lightly uh god is not happy with that okay now we are once again encouraged you know, to come to god uh because now the new covenant that we are in in after what jesus did and we studied so much about you know jesus making the way for us to enter into the presence of god in the book of hebrews so don't you think it's um it is so much more um, welcoming for the new testament believer as compared to the uh, to a, a, a devoted person under the old covenant so our access is a lot easier 
Uh, so in the following passages from uh, verses 18 to 21, that's what we see. We are told that um, you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and that burn with fire. Because we know that's how God appeared to Moses. He would come upon Mount Sinai you know, with, with fire and people would see that and tremble not just the people even for Moses it was he was afraid uh, to enter God's presence when God showed up in that manner and there, uh, to blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of a trumpet and the voice of words so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken to them anymore so that was the scene of how God came to meet with his people under the old covenant okay uh yeah so we've understood that so let's just skip we'll move uh to verse 22 so we've understood the scenario now how is our uh, path you know to the lord but you have come to mount zion so remember that you know, we have come to Mount Zion, and we we have already uh, you know seen this. We've seen this earlier. You know the comparison of uh, what this Mount Zion. We are Mount Zion. How you know God accepts us as His people, and you know we are redeemed. So we have we have seen what this Mount Zion represents, but now He calls Mount Zion the city of the living God, uh, the heavenly Jerusalem. And he says that there are innumerable company of angels to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. So our citizenship, we are Mount Zion, okay, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are the new Mount Zion. Um, now, this is not to neglect the, the promises, the many promises that God has for his own people, uh, the Jews, and for Israel. So we're not uh, talking replacement theology. That's not what we're taking, talking. But we also know that in a spiritual sense, the believers in the Lord Jesus, we are the new Mount Zion. And you see here that the church of the firstborn, who are registered in heaven. So where is our citizenship? You know, where is our uh, uh, real membership? We are members of local churches here and we see the value of local churches you know, here on the earth. But our true membership is in heaven. Okay, That's what we registered in heaven. Uh, to God, the judge of all to the spirits of just men made perfect okay and then he talks about the new covenant to jesus the mediator of the new covenant and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than the blood of abel so you know, we are now in the presence of god which looks different from the way it was under the old covenant there was fear trembling and people hesitated they didn't want to die because it was that you know awesome uh, as they looked at it but now because of what jesus has done we have that grace god is still awesome he's still mighty but we are covered under grace and we have an entrance into the god into god's presence because you know the blood of jesus forgives our sins and we have yeah, we have received the mercy of God. You know, it's like I'm remembering Esther. You know, do you recall um, there was a rule that you can't enter the king's presence without his permission. If you enter, then death is certain because that was the punishment. But, you know, Esther took a risk. There was one way, you know, the person entering without permission can, can be safe. And that is the king should extend his scepter. He had a, you know, scepter in his hand and he should sort of uh, touch that person and say, okay, you are permitted. I give you permission. And that was very rare. Okay. Uh, but he did that for Esther. He extended the scepter and said, okay, you are permitted to be in my presence. So it's like that. What the Lord Jesus has done for us. You know, it's very difficult to enter the presence of such a holy God. But it's like Jesus extending that scepter to us and saying, I have covered you. I have permitted you. 
you can come you can enjoy this holy god and uh, receive from this holy god so that's our privilege as new covenant believers now coming to verse 25 uh, we are encouraged to respond to God. So he says, see that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he has promised saying, yet once more, I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. So, you know, it's again... <clears throat> encouragement uh, intertwined with warning uh, again you know encouragement instruction so it's going all over the place here so again you know he's reminding the the believers that just now just because i talked about grace that you can enter god's presence and enjoy him you know, come to mount zion and all that he says don't forget that he's still an awesome god you know, he's a mighty god he's a just god and when god is we have this uh, uh, invitation for faith, you know, faith journey we have. You can't reject it. If you reject it, then it's it's sort of, uh, you know, you're rejecting Almighty God. So don't forget that. No, don't forget that. And remember that he is one who is uh, able to shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Okay, so he's that mighty. Yeah, and verse 27, now this, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken, as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain. And I'll go ahead with verse 28 also. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire so you know we are told here that um, everything is subject to god you know, he is the ultimate authority we see in scripture that he is seated you know and he rules over all the nations so uh this earth is not permanent you know, we saw that even in hebrews 1 he he the earth and even the heavens he'll roll it up like a like a cloak okay so everything on the earth and like even uh, you know uh, heaven you can uh, see that it can be shaken and god is also talking about a shaking which is coming he says um, removal of those things that are being shaken as of things that are made that the things cannot which cannot be shaken may remain so there are you know, this, this world is temporary. In other words, simply put, okay, some things can be shaken and they will be, they will not be there. And we know that, you know, um, heaven and earth will pass away, but God's word will remain. So there are some things that are temporary. They can be shaken. There are some things that are permanent, which will not be shaken. Right? God's word will not be shaken. You know, God will not be shaken. He is eternal, immutable God. And, you know, we are told that, we are receiving a kingdom. Now, what kind of kingdom is he giving us? Is it an earthly kingdom which can be shaken and which can be easily destroyed? No. But we have to rejoice because you, you all have done in second year, kingdom of God. Kingdom builders. What kind of kingdom are we building? See here. Receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken. Isn't that amazing? so amazing that God's kingdom, the kind of kingdom that we are a part of, it is an unshakable kingdom. That in itself, you know, must uh, bring us a lot of encouragement. So even when we see the world around us, you know, it's shaking, trembling, so many things are happening. What will happen? You know, will, will this world survive? Whatever it is. We now, those who believe in the Lord Jesus, we have this comfort and encouragement. The kingdom which we have, it is an unshakable kingdom. So we are confident. And so, you know, come on, believer, keep serving God. You know, keep uh, 
uh, yielding to the to the voice of god don't reject his voice that's what we are being told here he says let us have grace by which we may serve god acceptably so serve god continue to serve god how to serve god serve god on his terms not on our terms acceptably acceptable to god uh, with godly reverence reverence and godly fear you see again it's about our relationship with god these are all the elements holiness reverence godly fear we need that you know we can't just do it like okay just whatever i will do anything god is okay nobody is watching me that's not the right attitude for us to uh, serve this unshakable kingdom which we are receiving instead our attitude is wow you know i must honor god in every way he is a holy god i will serve him with holiness i will serve him with reverence reverence is uh, it's a good kind of a fear you're in again awe of this mighty god so you're doing things in a uh, um, in an honorable way to glorify this god so reverence godly fear that's the manner in which we should serve him for our god is a consuming fire you know god uh, and the work that he does it is seen in various ways it's explained in many ways but here you see another way god is a consuming fire he, he his presence is uh, uh, like a refining uh, powerful presence and that is why you know we we are told your god is a consuming fire and if you remember uh, there were times in the old testament when um, people would come to the altar and make an offering to god okay and what would happen you know the it, it'll just be like a fire will come it'll consume you know elijah god sent his presence like the fire came down and it it consumed solomon uh, gave god an offering and which was consumed by fire so that's our god he receives our offering as a holy god as a pure god okay so that's what we see so all right uh, class let's uh, go for a break now we have completed the hebrews chapter 12 uh, we will also finish hebrews 13 in the next hour and let me see you know if we can uh, go to first peter and cover some portions of that so just a minute uh, or two left here any thoughts any questions from your side i thought that was a you know very beautiful chapter very encouraging okay great so kiran aren everyone saying clear i'm happy to know that please to go back meditate we're all here to serve god right and that's how we must serve we've understood what jesus has done uh, in great depth and uh, we know that because of the way jesus has prepared the way we have access but that doesn't mean that we take that access lightly we are supposed to serve god with holiness with reverence with godly fear because our god is a consuming fire okay so uh, uh, let's take a 10 minute break class we'll come back uh, at uh, 10 o'clock and uh, resume with hebrews chapter 12 so uh, bye for now <laughs>